Good morning, everyone. I'm Lynn Holtain. I'm the Executive Director of the Victoria Law Foundation, and welcome to this international edition of the VLF Research Network. And today we are speaking about research into people-centred access to justice. We are really thrilled to have with us today Professor Rebecca Sandifer and Matthew ben Burnett and Dr Georgie Richner and Bridget McAloon for this session, and I will introduce them more fully in just a moment. But first, the Victoria Law Foundation stands on unceded Wurundjeri land, and I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians recognising their abiding connection to this land, its waterways and community. It is my privilege to pay respects to their elders and to all the generations who have nurtured this land for over 50,000 years and continue to do so. And to the traditional custodians of the lands, wherever you may, may be joining us, whether that's the US, Estonia, India, or across Australia. We believe that acknowledging the past is an essential step in building a better and more equitable future. We recognize the impact of colonization, its legacy of injustice, and the marginalization of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We aim to break down the barriers to justice for all Victorians through our work in research, education, and grants. We are committed to making a sincere and positive contribution to a better justice system for all of us, but especially to those who are vulnerable and most in need. Just a, a couple of housekeeping matters before we get underway. As you will be well aware, we're in a webinar format, so only the panelists uh, can be seen and heard. We will have time for questions at the end, so please use the Q&A function to put your question uh, to the panel. And you can also upvote other people's uh, questions as normal if you're particularly interested in something that's already been raised, and we'll get to as many of those at the end of our conversation as possible. And we are recording, so you will receive a link to, to the, the video uh, after today's event. So please feel free to re-watch or to send to friends and family and or colleagues. Today, as I mentioned, we're looking into people-centered justice at two different but very related levels, the global and the local. This is really exciting and contemporary work, and we are really delighted to have four highly impressive presenters share their perspectives with us today. So let me start with our first pair. Professor Rebecca Sandifer is Director of the School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University. She investigates civil justice and access to civil justice from very diverse angles, from how legal services are delivered and consumed how civil legal aid is organized in the US, the relative efficacy of lawyers and non-lawyers and digital tools as advisors and representatives, and how ordinary people think about their justice problems and try to resolve them. So this is very central to, to Becky's work. In addition to her appointment at ASU, Arizona State, Professor Sandifer is faculty fellow at the American Bar Foundation where she founded and leads the Access to Justice Research in Initiative, and where she is co-founder with her co-presenter today, Matthew Burnett of Frontline Justice. And Becky may well be known to, to many of you as a co-author on our Public Understanding of Law survey reports. It is tremendous to have you back with us, Becky. Matthew Burnett is Senior Program Officer for the Access to Justice Research in Initiative at the American Bar Foundation, a visiting scholar with the Justice Futures Project at Arizona State, and an adjunct professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center. He also serves as an advisor to the National Center for Justice for Access to Justice, and as you heard, co-founded Frontline Justice with Becky Sandifer. Before joining the ABF, Matthew worked at Open Society Foundations to advance access to justice and legal empowerment through research, advocacy, litigation, and grant making in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and the US, so a truly global perspective. 
Earlier in his career, he co-founded and led the Immigration Advocates Network and also served, fascinatingly, as law clerk to Justice Yaku of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Welcome, Matthew. It's also wonderful to see you again. Dr. Georgie Richner and Bridget McAloon both joined the Victoria Law Foundation in June 2023 as senior researchers. We are delighted to have them both on board. Georgie has a PhD in legal history from Monash and a background in quantitative and qualitative research, including as a senior analyst for the Victorian Parliamentary Budget Office and several leading Australian universities. Her work has been published in the International Journal for Crime, Justice and Social Democracy and other parts as well. Bridget is an evaluation specialist with over 20 years experience in monitoring, assessment using quant and qualitative measurement and analysis. She holds a Master of Public Health from Monash University and has a background in international and community not-for-profits. Bridget led evaluation and research for eight years at Victoria Legal Aid, driving evidence-based practice to underpin the design and delivery of effective client-centered legal services. Just to give you a, a bit of an intro before I throw to Becky and Matthew, it seems to me that putting people at the center of justice seems extraordinarily straightforward. Build the systems which serve the people using them. But as we all know on this call, this is not generally the case. And even where there's good intent, it seems to be an, a, an awful lot easier said than done. One tried and tested way to understand the experience of people in justice is through legal needs surveys. More than 100 countries have run them, including one you may have heard of recently. It's called the Public Understanding of Law Survey, and we did it here at the VLF. But what legal needs work shows over and over again is that civil justice problems are common. Virtually everyone experiences them across the life course, and many people routinely experience them every year or every few years. We also know very clearly that repeated experience of these kinds of problems is inextricably linked to social disadvantage and can have profound and negative effects on people's lives. Matthew and Becky's work used legal needs study data to highlight this disconnect between institutional arrangements and legal systems and people's actual legal needs and capabilities, which is a mismatch that we also alluded to in Pulse. Over the last two decades, a new lens has developed on civil legal issues and the effects that they have. Amen. It centers on people's experience of justice and on supporting people-oriented solutions to those issues. Fundamentally, as I think is very clear, we need systems and processes which are accessible, which are proportionate, and which focus on outcomes for people. And these are approaches that we're exploring in our new Measure for Measure project, which Georgie and Bridget will discuss after we hear from Brett, uh, Becky Sandifer and Matthew Burnett about the global context in which this work sits. And don't forget, we'll have a Q&A at the end, so keep your questions till then. But without further ado, can I pass now to Becky Sandifer and Matthew Burnett. Great, thank you, Lynn. Um, so I'm gonna start by spending maybe 10 or 15 minutes uh, providing some background on the Justice Data Observatory and our new report. And then I'm gonna hand things over to Becky to discuss uh, some of the findings and next steps of the report. Uh, so the Justice Data Observatory was launched in early 2023 as a partnership between the American Bar Foundation, the World Bank, uh, OECD, and the Canadian International Development Research Center. And its goals are really to, one, convene groups of researchers, policymakers, and practitioners across low, middle, and high-income countries. And we've done that over the last year. We had a great kickoff on the sidelines of the International Legal Aid Group Conference at Harvard last year and then a workshop at the OECD Access to Justice Roundtable in Slovenia, and um, more recently a webinar, um, which Nigel Bomer joined us for 
on sort of uh, emerging issues and legal needs measurement. Another goal is to develop synthetic uh, and integrative approaches to shared research questions on access to justice globally, and then also to support the production and dissemination of original access to justice research and sources of data <clears throat> related to shared research questions. Um, and then finally, to advocate for evidence-based approaches to access to justice policy and practice. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we launched our first report and policy brief uh, late last year, and it represents the first phase of a global um, meta-research project on access to justice and its relationship to three core objectives, reducing poverty and inequality, promoting inclusive development and growth, and empowering democratic participation in governments. So we're really interested in what the policy, the, the policy aspects or impacts of people-centered access to justice are. And then I think to, um, um, to link these to uh, sort of um, to what we already know about uh, access to justice. And so both of the, both the policy brief and the report, I think if we haven't already shared with you, we can do that in the chat or as a follow-up, uh, but we'll make sure that those are available as well. Um, so in the research, we sought to discover three things. The first is um, sort of foundational discoveries. So what do we already know? And as Liz mentioned, a lot of this is informed largely by existing legal needs studies. So we've got, as she said, um, studies, there are about 230 studies in um, over 100 countries. Um, and a great resource for those if you want to investigate is the World Justice Project has a legal needs or atlas of legal needs studies that you can Google and find and um, and see where those studies are happening and, and what they're asking and what the impacts are. The second is um, sort of critical unanswered questions. So, so what do we need to know? And then the final question was, uh, what are the important knowledge gaps uh, and, the, and the research and data that, that we need to fill those gaps? And so that question is really around how do we get there? We also wanted to understand research and context. So we started to identify three dimensions where we have existing data that might tell us something about how and what uh, research is pursued in different contexts. And so we looked at three different dimensions. The first was income classifications. So low, middle and high income uh, countries using data from the World Bank. We also wanted to understand civil justice functions. So we used the World Justice Project's rule of law index. And then finally, we wanted to understand social inclusiveness. As Lynn said, um, the, the disproportionate impact of civil justice problems are often on uh, marginalized and excluded populations. And there we used a data set developed by the UC Berkeley uh, Otherness and Belonging Institute. So the next slide um, shows the map, <laughs> which you can't see very well here, but you can actually see in the report, which tells us the levels at which um, those three dimensions are operating in different parts of the world. And um, as we did that, we want to also wanted to overlay that with existing studies or existing um, research that was happening in different parts of the world. And so we conducted a literature scan about what has already been studied and what kinds of contexts those things and, and which those things have happened. So we identified initially around 200 articles or studies using OneSearch and existing literature reviews. And then we coded over 100 of those articles or studies uh, that offered empirical evidence on the relationship of uh, between access to justice and those um, three areas of policy impact. So democracy, poverty, and development, and then situated the context that the, um, that the, the studies were um, conducted in uh, to look at the three different data dimensions that we discussed on the last slide. So the World Bank data, the World Justice Project data, and the other Nittles and Belonging Institute data. And what we found was that the majority of the empirical research studies focused on legal empowerment and democracy. So that was the largest um, group of, of, of research and studies, uh, which was then followed by research on uh, impacts on poverty alleviation. And finally, the smallest number of studies were on uh, development. And so interestingly, more attention has been given to research on legal empowerment and democracy than to some of the material outcomes like uh, poverty reduction and distributed growth in these empirical studies. And then finally, uh, we conducted a number of interviews with global informants with expertise in access to justice, including researchers, practitioners, and donors. 
Um, and we ask them the same question. So what do we know? What do we need to know? And what uh, data do we need uh, to know the things that we want to know? So I think um, through those studies then, um, what we found was the experts consistently reinforced these foundational discoveries. So this includes, as Liz mentioned, the foundational uh, research that we've um, gained or, or, or uh, insight that we've gained over the last 20 to 30 years of legal needs studies across the world. Um, we learned um, that, as, as Lynn suggested, legal problems are ubiquitous and they affect everyone but they also disproportionately impact um, folks who are marginalized and excluded and people with low incomes. We, we uh, learned that formal legal systems or know that formal legal systems and lawyers are largely peripheral uh, to the resolution of most civil justice problems, that many judici justiciable issues should be or could be resolved without formal justice institutions. And finally, that people who experience legal problems care much more about the impact on their lives or their life outcomes uh, than they do about the resolution of legal matters or case outcomes. So at the highest level, um, we, we identified three things. First, that there's really an urgent need for more research attention on access to justice in most of the world and really all of the world. Over half of the country types that we identified received little or no research attention. The second is we found that um, middle income countries are more studied than high or low income countries, which I don't think is intuitive, um, but I think that's likely tied to the uh, disproportionate amount of development assistance that goes into uh, middle income countries as opposed to high income or low income. And then uh, I think finally with that, um, I will turn things over to Becky to discuss the emerging research agenda and perhaps or consensus maybe coming out of this research and take us a little bit deeper into the findings. Thank you, Matthew. Um, when we talk to the global experts, it's not moving. It stopped moving. Oh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> when we talk to the to the global experts, they they coalesced, they had lots of ideas, and it was wonderful of them to give us the time that they gave us. But their ideas coalesced around three different kinds of knowledge that they felt like um, both research and practice and funders and government needed to, to think about how to work uh, people-centered access to justice in ways that achieve the important policy goals that those different actors have. One of the kinds of, of information that they wanted was information that would make people care about people-centered access to justice at all. So they wanted to be able to show that the things that they cared about and were working on were important and impactful for the kinds of outcomes that, that this literature cares about. So for development, for democracy, and for the amelioration of poverty. And one of the things that came through in their description of, of this kind of knowledge was that different kinds of audiences are moved by different kinds of facts. So particularly technocratic government agencies like systematic facts that you can count, like cost benefit analyses and things like that, um, but other people are more, more moved and, and, and quicker to connect with stories or anecdotes that make things seem real, that show you what happens in people's actual lives when um, they can achieve justice and what happens with their poverty or, their, or the a community's growth or a community's empowerment. So that was the first kind of knowledge that um, the group seemed to, to think was, was really critical. The second was, was information for understanding how justice matters, right? So, so what is, if we, if we invest in people-centered access to justice, what do we get from actually doing that? Um, and they had a set of, of key questions that implied certain data needs. So if we wanna understand how people-centered justice affects inclusive growth or people's empowerment in democracy or, or, or combats poverty, um, we need to know how, how it actually affects people's life outcomes. So we need to know more than the, the resolution of a case, but do you actually still have a place to live? Can you pay your bills? Uh, can you make a living? Um, and so that means that we need to be collecting information about what actually matters to people, um, their actual life outcomes, uh, over and beyond the things that a, a legal system would collect in terms of cases or something like that. Um, they also wanted to understand how how we might make system level change happen. 
Um, and one of the themes that emerged in that interest was that we need much greater um, access to institutional data. So um, I don't know about the jurisdiction that you are in right now, but in mine, um, courts are public and the, the information that they create are public and public agencies are the information and, and the information they create are public, but it's not always easy to get your hands on that information that's supposed to already be yours as a member of the public. Um, so we need to think about ways to make that information exchange uh, smoother and easier. Um, and finally, they were really interested in how we might achieve collective empowerment. So not just an individual feeling more confident or more capable to resolve their issues, but communities being able to recognize and organize around their own interests in, in, in ways that let them be democratic actors. Um, and one of the issues that came up in, in the needs there is that we don't really have the best, although we're developing them, and the legal capability work that's coming out of Pulse is a great example of this, but we need new ways to measure this and new measures of it. Um, and that's really something that they identified as kind of a cutting edge need for, for producing this kind of knowledge. The third kind of knowledge that they wanted was sort of the never ending what works questions, someone called it. So, so if we can, if, what is it that solves the specific problems that we're, that we're, that we want to work on? And, and then how can we make those solutions sustainable? And how can we scale them up for the kinds of vast need that you see in every jurisdiction uh, for people who need assistance with, with different kinds of legal issues? There you have a, a, a different set of key questions. So if, if we care about what works, sort of what works for who and, and when and where and under what circumstances, um, they wanna know about the, the costs and benefits of, of providing justice services. Um, because in real governments or, or real budgetary situations, you, you can never pay for everything that you want to. And so they want to, to be able to understand how an investment in justice um, shapes other things that they care about. And then, you know, how can we scale these things up? I think that if you look across either global research or research just in the United States, we're, we're pretty good at figuring out what is effective but we are not necessarily so good at figuring out how to scale these kinds of solutions, particularly solutions that are not top down, but are really centered around people and their experiences. And so if these are the kinds of questions that, that you have, then you need lots of systematically collected data that lets you compare experiences and impacts for different kinds of populations. Um, so you can understand what works when, where, for whom, et cetera. And, and then you need administrative data from lots of different kinds of providers both inside the justice sector and outside the justice sector, so you can understand how long things take and how much they cost and what the staff investments and, and IT investments in them are and so on. So our experts were great in, in giving us um, the, the sort of the need for these three kinds of knowledge and, and some sense of the kinds of data we would need to, to have that knowledge. The, the project now is at its, in its phase, its second phase, um, and that's to, as Matthew said, if you, if you divide the world up based on income group and social inclusiveness and civil justice function, there are whole swaths of the world, um, dozens and dozens of countries about which we, we were not able to find any research. So our, our next step is to work with um, an international team that includes three PhD students. So we're also trying to make a new generation of, of access to justice workers to do interviews with key informants in at least one country in each type. So in that big categorization that Matthew described to get their sense of, of whether, first of all, this research agenda makes sense given where they are, but also to get their sense of what is happening in their country and their region. Maybe, maybe fascinating things are going on and we haven't been able to discover it yet. Um, and then finally, we'll do a case study of three countries in different parts of the world at different income levels to sort of see if this this agenda makes sense in those countries, right? Could could a government could a government official find it useful to, to have this agenda? Could a researcher find it find it useful to have this agenda? So um, stay tuned for phase two. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. It's been it's been a pleasure. And now I will pass the baton to um, Dr. Rickner and Ms. McLoom. Thank you, Becky. And I think I speak for everyone here in saying how excited we are to see the next steps of, of that research project. Uh, can everyone see my screen? No, Bridget? 
<clears throat> Here we go. Um, so thank you everyone for attending what has so far been an excellent research network session. Uh, my name is Georgie Rickner, and today with my colleague Bridget McAloon, we are very briefly going to introduce our new project, which is a Victorian-based project, so we're bringing it down to the local here, and that project is titled Measure for Measure, Tailoring Everyday Justice. So I'll speak first on how we came to this project, and then Bridget will touch on how this project is positioned within the global people-centred justice research agenda. The Victoria Law Foundation's data mapping reports examined how administrative data is collected and used across the Victorian civil justice system. So these reports demonstrated that there are challenges with data collection. And Becky, you just mentioned the need for administrative data, uh, but there is a system-wide need for smarter data that goes beyond the, admin the administrative and beyond outputs and activity data to what outcomes those outputs and activities are achieving. Put simply, the data mapping reports found that the administrative data that is currently collected is often not enough to tell us what works to effectively meet people's legal needs. Our public understanding of law survey, referred to as the pulse, laid the groundwork in revealing legal problem prevalence in Victoria and shows that there are high rates of unmet legal need, even when, or, espe or even especially when, Victorians are using legal services. The Pulse found that where legal need existed, 78% went unmet. The data shows a clear mismatch between what people need and what they are getting. Volume 2 of The Pulse, released in February this year, further explored these issues through the lens of legal capability, that is, the knowledge, skills, resources and opportunities required for someone to effectively access justice. The data shows that legal capability is varied and often unequally distributed across different demographics and communities. So like legal need and the experience of legal problems, levels of legal capability are also tied to disadvantage. Different levels of capability give rise to different legal policy and practice challenges. Pulse Volume 2 emphasises how considering capability is key to a better, more tailored fit of legal services and support. Overall, the Pulse highlights that there are diverse causes and consequences of legal problems and significant uh, very high rates of unmet legal need calls for a multifac multifaceted response, one that caters to the legal capability of diverse subpopulations. So no individual organisation or solution can adequately respond to fix the issues identified in the Pulse. As a follow-on to, uh, to the data mapping series and the Pulse reports, and now with sound understanding of the legal need that exists, our research team is looking to explore what is working well in Victoria to meet that need through this new project. Our aim is to build a collective knowledge of what works for particular clients and communities to help meet their legal needs and to effectively access justice. Our aim is to build, sorry, in searching for a suitable framework from which to approach this crucial and enduring question of what works, we turn to the global literature on people-centered justice. So this is an approach to access to justice that really resonated with the aims of our project and one that provides an effective scaffold to really understand and evidence what is working or has potential to work to support people with their everyday justice problems. Gaining traction over the past two decades, people-centred justice is a framework that shifts the focus from justice institutions to the people who navigate them and the justice issues that they experience. International organisations such as the OECD and the Hague Institute for Innovation of Law increasingly use people-centred justice as a lens through which to, access, to assess access to justice on a global scale. This literature emphasizes the, emphasizes the role of access to justice as a crucial component of democratic function and economic development. The field is broad, interdisciplinary, and pursues varied global aims and outcomes. So in 2023, the Justice Data Observatory put forward a research brief titled Envisioning a People-Centered Access to Justice Research Agenda, as Becky has very helpfully just outlined. This emerging research agenda calls for three types of knowledge, and as you can see on the slide, our proposed project ties directly to that third type of knowledge in the bottom left, which is knowledge for implementation. Knowledge for implementation requires an understanding of what solutions are effective, how to sustain them, and how to scale them. These three framing notions, effective, sustainable, and scalable, are further explored and unpacked by our fellow presenters, Becky and Matthew, in their recent work, 
as they posit shared research questions to use in access to justice research. Understanding whether an initiative is effective, if it is sustainable, and if it is scalable is a useful way into the work we want to do at the Victoria Law Foundation as a next step in our journey from the data mapping and pulse reports. It's a way to start to synthesise and distill the varied responses to legal needs into their con common elements, which can then be used to generate useful and practical recommendations for policy, planning, design and funding. It's a way to bring together the theoretical and practical to really ideally start to make those real shifts we want to see in increasing access to justice. Georgie, could you just flip the slide, please? <laughs> Thanks. So central to the framework of people-centred justice is evidence of effectiveness. Is a given program, initiative or service effective at achieving its own goals for those it hopes to serve? How are program goals and the target clients for a solution arrived at? And then how do we know if such solutions actually work? What does it mean that something works in justice? How is that understood and what evidence is used? Knowing what works in practice to meet people's legal needs for who and when and having clear data and evidence to support this knowledge is foundational to the operationalization of people-centred justice and being able, actually able to do more of what works. Sustainable. If a service initiative or policy is affecting at achieving its desired goals, can it continue to do so reliably over the long term? Victoria is known as the land of the pilot. Good initiatives might start as a pilot with funding for two years, and even when an evaluation finds the initiative works, there's no guarantee or even avenue to access ongoing funding. As new funding rounds roll around and they want something new and shiny, and so this good work is sort of left on the discard pile. What's the evidentiary burden required to attract ongoing funding and what's needed to move something that might have been a nice idea piloted on the side into the central mode of how an organisation does its work? And turning to scalability, if an activity is effective and sustainable, is it also scalable? Can the model grow and be translated to other communities, contexts, legal matters or even jurisdictions? There can be tension between effectiveness, sustainability and scalability of interventions. Services that are tailored to particular legal needs are often locally designed in response to a specific problem or a particular client or community. As Becky discussed, it, they sort of come from the ground up. The more responsive an initiative is, the more tailored, the less effective it might be if it is scaled up and rolled out more broadly. Even if the target community remains the same, Geography, access to services, legal capability and jurisdiction can affect whether a service that is successful in one place actually can translate to another place. So we're hoping to investigate some of these questions and these tensions in our new project, Measure for Measure, Tailoring Everyday Justice. So turning to our project now, so using people-centred justice as a scaffold, particularly the framing notions of effectiveness, sustainability and scalability, our new project aims to explore, understand and share what is seen to be working in the delivery of justice solutions across Victoria, Australia, <laughs> working to meet the legal need Pulse has so clearly identified with a central goal of generating useful knowledge to inform policy and practice. It's an exploratory piece of research. The first phase includes a survey that we have distributed and promoted broadly and that asks the Victorian justice sector what is seen to be working to meet legal need, for whom, for what legal problems and under what circumstances. We seek to collate and explore examples of justice solutions that reflect how service providers are meeting people where they are. We want to build an understanding of how working is actually understood and evidenced across the sector, along with highlighting the common barriers to sustaining and scaling up good ideas. So the survey is now live. For those of you based in Victoria, Australia, we're looking to capture from you specific initiatives, services, policies or practices that you have designed to target particular clients and communities or to meet a particular legal need. We're looking for things that are currently operating in Victoria or previously operated and had to close that ran or have been running for at least six months and actually look to be working or at least show promise in meeting a legal need. What are these good ideas that are out there that people should know more about? Um, the unsung initiatives. 
please go. We'll put the registration link in our survey, but please go to our website as well to find registration for the survey. We're, we're casting a very wide lens and are really looking for local solutions and ideas that you would love to tell people more about. Our final report will elaborate, will elaborate on the modalities of the interventions. It will build a deeper understanding of those common elements underpinning what works. It will explore opportunities and challenges associated with identifying and tailoring services to need and look critically at the evidence required to close the loop and design, implement and evaluate more effective and efficient justice models. Our aim is to contribute to building out an operational model of people-centred justice, to test and flesh out what this people-centred justice looks like in practice in Victoria. And this operational model we are hoping can produce useful research results that provide independent evidence to inform and support the design, funding and implementation of the legal help Victorians need. And though we are focusing on Victoria, we anticipate that there will be takeaways for the global access to justice research community. If you would like to complete the survey, uh, we've just put a link to the registration plan, uh, registration page in the chat, and the link is also on our PowerPoint slides that will circulate after the session. Our survey is open until the 12th of uh, April, and we would love to hear from you to help contribute to our little piece of the People Centered Justice Access to Research <laughs> um, agenda. So thank you very much. Okay, well, there we have it. Um, some really interesting perspectives, both global and 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 really uh, large scale and very local and critical. And I think, uh, as we heard from from all our panelists, the two are very closely related, and one will inform the other in in really useful ways. I love that last slide, Bridget, but I do have to ask you, is that actually from a production of Measure for Measure or it looks like an 80s film clip? <laughs> it's, from, it's from some production. Uh, yeah, we've gone really uh, deep with our imagery. <laughs> deep into the Shakespearean references. Okay, I'll have to reread the text and pull out my quotes in future. But we'd love to hear from you. If you've got questions uh, you'd like to put to uh, our panellists, please jump on the, the Q&A function. We have uh, a, a very extensive note from uh, Nigel Butler, who has joined us online, to tell us that Measure for Measure is really exciting. Thank you, Nigel. We appreciate that very um, uh, very much indeed, given that he named it. I think he, he deserves some credit for that. But he has a quick question, probably for Becky, he says. The idea of people being moved by different types of information is one that is very familiar. And this actually goes to exactly what I was going to to put to you, to Becky. And his predictable concern is that people are moved by and make policy with data that is not fit for purpose. This can be overreach or generalizing things that can't be generalized or, or just using research that is not very good. So how do we ensure that quality research and data drives policy and that findings are used appropriately, avoiding risky policy making? How do we get research literacy into policy? Well, I think that's an eternal question in terms of the translation between uh, the evidence base and the uh, political environment in which they often land. But I will throw to our uh, esteemed colleagues in Becky Sandifer and Matthew on that one. Becky, do you want to pick it up first? Um, I mean, I think it's a great question. And it's any researcher is always frustrated by that. <laughs> we do all this work and yet. It's not implemented in a, in a clinical and technocratic way. Um, I think one of the things that we try to do um, through the Justice Data Observatory, but also through some other projects in the United States, is bring policymakers and researchers into conversation with each other so that they develop relationships and can kind of understand where each other are coming from and hopefully develop trust and, and sort of move forward together. So I think that's an important activity to make possible the, the good translation of research into, into practice and policy. Matthew, I don't know what you have to add. Yeah, so I mean, I think a couple of examples of that. One, we received a small grant from the National Science Foundation to bring together federal agency um, uh, actors with researchers and to talk about both what are the opportunities for research and what are some of the challenges, and then fairly consistently invite practitioners, policymakers, and others to 
um, to convenings that that we host alongside our major kind of civil legal aid conferences um, and sessions at those conferences. I think that in the U.S. context anyway, and I, I, I'm, I suspect this is true elsewhere, there is a bit of an uneasy relationship between the research community and practitioners. Um, some of that comes just from a misunderstanding of research and methods, but it also comes from when we see these kind of transformative moments and, and new knowledge, um, um, you know, which question or undermine existing uh, ways of doing things in the world and, and ways in which programs and policies have invested, I think that creates a tension. And I think really this kind of engagement strategy of getting folks into conversation with one another has been important to uh, ameliorate at least some of the concern or suspicion and really have folks in conversation and talking to one another, because um, I think it, it has certainly been a challenge here. I think there, there are two different tiers here. One is that the data collected is done in, an, in a, you know, a really rigorous way and that it's, it's reliable. And the second is how the policy makers uh, deal with that, uh, you know, whether or not they impose their own uh, particular fascinations. Uh, I spent a little bit of time working with a former transport minister who one day rang up and said, right, we're going to slow all the traffic around schools down to 30 k's an hour. And she would made that decision because she had just dropped her daughter off at school. So suddenly the whole policy agenda got changed, despite the fact that the, the evidence was different in terms of speed limits around schools. So, you know, th there is no accounting for what happens even when the data is sound, even when it's read and understood, and then it can get uh, diverted at the last. So, you know, the, the data literacy point, I think, is exceptionally well made. We somehow need to get our politicians and their advisors and the whole sort of ecology of, of uh, decision making to a level of, of uh, greater sophistication. But Matthew, I want to come back to something that you said uh, in, in your presentation around access to justice not necessarily being access to justice institutions. And that is a really fascinating concept and one that uh, I think those of us who, who live and breathe this stuff understand in a quite sophisticated way, but people find that really challenging. If you say to them, access to justice does not necessarily equal access to more lawyers or more courts or more um, you know, community legal centres or whatever. You know, it, it, it's a revolutionary idea that um, that justice is not constrained within what we currently understand to be the justice institutions. Can you tease that out a wee bit more and talk a bit further about, and I think Becky called it justice services, but they could look very different. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, we're really fortunate to have about a decade or more of Becky's work that is essentially making this case, right, um, from the community legal needs survey she did and beyond. Um, and so I think that increasingly folks understand the, the data and they understand the concept, um, whether or not that's translating to policy impacts or ways in which people are, are practicing uh, the, the the data and research, I think, is another question. One of the things that Frontline Justice does and why we founded it was actually to be a center of gravity for both the research and, and, and the impact that, that we want that research to have in the world. And we are seeing um, regulatory shifts in the U.S. So the state of Alaska just uh, last year um, passed a waiver that allows Alaska Legal Services to deploy non-lawyer community-based justice workers that are embedded in communities uh, to um, provide um, legal advice and representation. Those conversations are happening in Arizona and Texas. The Texas Justice, Justice Commission just um, made recommendations to the Su Supreme Court for community justice worker policy. And I think that, that it, once folks have started to see what that looks like on the ground, it's much easier. And I think that um, the ways in which we've been very intentional about embedding research and data into the DNA of these initiatives, so we can both build our own knowledge, but also build confidence beyond uh, you know, a single program uh, or intervention has been really helpful. And I guess the last thing that I would say is that, um, you know, one of the challenges is getting outside of our bubble, right? And so 
Um, Becky's iceberg analogy is very good here, right? If all we can see is the tip of the iceberg, then it's very hard to recognize all the stuff that's ha happening beneath the surface. And um, so I think doing more to kind of understand what's happening in the shadows, existing programs in the US, we have a number of different ways in which non-lawyers have provided advocacy for more than 50 years in the immigration context, tribal lay advocates, jailhouse lawyers, there's all of these examples of uh, existing kind of knowledge and experience that we can pull from as we design these new programs. And then um, it's also just hard. I mean, it's hard to get people to shift. As I said earlier, if programs have been doing things the same way for 50 years or more, uh, it's very hard um, to, to, to affect that kind of cultural change within legal aid organizations, within courts and other institutions. Uh, and so I think it just takes kind of sustained commitment um, to what the research says and what the data shows. And, and hopefully, as I suggested earlier, product, uh, uh, you know, helpful conversations between the various actors to help us all understand what the, what the challenges and, and ultimately opportunities are in, in the shift. But it, it's not an easy road. Yeah, um, and addressing vested interests that uh, are there for you know, de decades and trying to move people to the ultimate end of, of greater access to justice and people-centred justice is, um, as you say, uh, 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 I think a, an epic of perseverance. Becky, I've got a, another question which I think goes very neatly to, to one of your areas of, of expertise, which is about digital access. And uh, Tatiana has, has asked us, how important do you think that digital initiatives are in helping public and various intermediaries understand, advocate and access legal help? I think that's really interesting that she's noted not only public, but also intermediary connection. Have you got thoughts on that? I think that what these technologies do is empower intermediaries to do things that would be much more difficult in their absence, but that the intermediaries are almost always critical. So if you look at the, the use of, of actually really cool tools, so if you wanna see a cool tool, um, there's one out of New York City called Just Fix that lets you write, it does a range of things, but lets you write a really good complaint letter to your landlord about whatever condition violation you have. Um, and they do get some people like you or I who might find that and write a great letter to their landlord, but a lot of it is done through tenant unions or community organizations or religious organizations. Um, because most of us, when we need help, even though we all use Google all the time now and soon we'll use AI or whatever, um, we often want a human being to guide us through the use of that help. Um, or we go to human beings in the places that we usually go to, like church or uh, another religious organization or a community organization or your neighbor. Um, and so what technology can do is replicate access to that stuff, to those different kinds of intermediaries in a way that's harder without, without it. Um, and so that's where I see most of, of the promise in technology is in by empowering, empowering the helpers. Empowering the helpers to help more. Uh, uh, and um, in Pulse 2, we, we saw that so many people go to intermediaries for, for advice and support around their legal problems and, and um, trying to understand exactly, you know, what that list was, was also revelatory in the uh, the types of, of people and organisations that people turn to when they, they know they've got a legal problem. They don't necessarily, uh, as we know, go to, to legal help for it. They look for trusted sources and that's a, a really critical, I think, amplifier uh, of, um, of legal help. Bridget, I want to, to talk to you about scalability uh, because it seems to me that we have been, pardon my, my cynicism around this, talking about um, what works for a very long time. And as someone who's been involved in, in evaluation and monitoring and looking at the scene and what's functioning and what's not for, for many, many years, why is it so damn hard to be able to scale something up? Good question. <laughs> um, I think sometimes it's because we don't trust the evidence. We don't trust uh, results that this is a good idea. And we don't, the evidence isn't um, perhaps providing in a way that gives us enough information of how to design it for other contexts. 
other um, legal matters, other population. And we don't trust that that evidence is giving us what we need to then go, yeah, this is a good idea. We can actually do that for this legal problem or this client group. And therefore, there's sort of this, let's start again from scratch. There's part of that. I think part of it's funding, access to funding, um, and recognising that, you know, huge amounts of money are often then needed to scale up. I think that's some of the challenges. And some of the challenges are we're not necessarily building enough um, evaluation in to even just not even we don't trust it, but we're not building in the right types of data collection, the right types of evaluation to really understand what it is about um, a service or an initiative that is working that then can be rolled out, what it is and how does it work. I think some of the challenges, so I'm touching on everything, some of the challenges also go to the mm -hmm. part of do we understand enough about how it works and what it actually is. I think some of the times we, it's hard to identify what is different about an initiative to normal service provision. What so And to actually unpack what it is that has been done that is working and to create that journey between what, what are we doing? What is the what? And then what is it and how it works? And so I think it's being able to pull together those threads in a more compelling and trusted way uh, with a, more evidence to then go, okay, this is the part that work and this is why it works. And then really being able to have that time and space to understand, well, then this is how it could be rolled out to other populations and other sources. That's, you know, apart from some of those other tensions, though, about some of the things that do work are because they are so local and they are so um, responsive to particular local needs. So some things aren't scalable and actually recognise, trying to understand what is the difference between something that is a good idea but is so specific for a local problem versus some of those things that have elements that can be rolled out and can be taken forward. But it's not about taking something wholesale. It's about taking those elements that are working that could work for other populations. So we'll measure for measure look at those characteristics around, okay, this is working brilliantly for a community in Western Victoria which has particular circumstances and a particular uh, community uh, and it's not necessarily going to work in or Wodonga or um, Gippsland or Melbourne. Exactly. That is what we're hoping to do. And I think part of it is using that framework of effectiveness to understand what is making it effective. What are those components that are common, that it could be common to other populations, to other legal problems, to other client groups, um, and trying to then look at the solutions, the variety of solutions we're hoping to gather through Measure for Measure and actually start to go, well, this solution looks really unique over here and this one, but actually the common element is this. And how do we look to then scale up that part of these models because that is actually similar across all these different things. So it's sort of trying to unpack the component parts of the initiatives and the solutions and understand, well, what is that? And then how do we start to look at what we need to scale up those component parts? That's exactly the sort of stuff we're hoping to dive into, into uh, the Measure for Measure project and start to really pull out so it's not just about saying, oh, here's some great ideas, have a look at them, but actually start to go, well, what do we do with these great ideas? How do we take them to the next level? And how do we bring them together to actually go, although on the surface they look so different, they've actually got these very mm. similar parts that are useful for a whole range of problems and for a whole range of populations. Thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, Georgie the, <laughs> the uh, golden ticket question, which Rosie has, has just put in the chat around impact of the project uh, measure for measure, which is, OK, how do we get beyond the pilot uh, and the short term thinking uh, to to really, I think, apply the sorts of uh, results and uh, uh, theory that uh, that measure for measure will pull out the sort of commonalities of what makes something really successful. How can we replicate that, even if it doesn't look exactly the same in all places? What do you reckon, Georgie? How are we going to uh, make this really stick? Look, it's a difficult task, and the measure for measure report is an ambitious one in that it's not just for the civil justice sector in Victoria or the global research community. We're also trying to uh, catch the attention of policymakers and and sort of hopefully make an impact 
um, like Rosie has framed in her question. Uh, but yeah, I've seen it from the other side. I've worked in government and seen policy being formed and costed. And um, there is a problem, particularly in Victoria, about just throwing money at short-term pilots to see if something will work. And I suppose one of the aims of our project is saying, well, actually, we've done some of that work for you. We can see that certain initiatives are working, whether it be for very tailored communities or, as Bridget said, those common elements that could be scaled up and rolled out um, to other sort of demographics and communities as well. Um, and so, yeah, our aim is to sort of show, well, here are some initiatives that are working and they have sort of data and they have the longevity and sustainability already to show that they have been working. But then there might also be initiatives where they, they think something is working or showing promise, but they actually, they don't need sort of a year or two of pilot funding. They maybe need uh, funding towards more resources or data capability in order to evidence what works before we think of those broader questions. So it's teasing out sort of not just throwing money at what might work, but showing actually there are initiatives that are working, but they need certain funding and resources in order to be able to work. And also, I suppose we're trying to take the focus away from this um, notion in government that uh, governments like to be seen as progressive. And we all know on this call, a lot of these problems have existed for decades. Uh, but there is a tendency in government to think, okay, well, Everything we've uh, thrown money at hasn't worked. What is the newest and shiniest innovation? What is something we haven't tried before that uses AI or something very cutting edge? And I suppose our project is trying to take the focus away from those shiny. I mean, we still want to hear about cutting edge initiatives, but we also want to shed light on those initiatives that have quietly been working, but have perhaps been underfunded or there is a deficit in sort of data to show how they work and who they work for. The, the the example that just sits in my head uh, constantly as the the land of the pilot quintessential is the neighborhood justice center which has been you know in situ for what 20 years now or certainly 15 i think um and was always intended as a rollout and for those of you who are unaware of the mjc it is postcard uh, postcard postcode justice at its very best so it sits in a suburb of melbourne it services the people who live in that vicinity and no one else but it provides an extraordinary service in terms of, of people-centered justice in very many uh, diverse ways and they have evolved over time it was always intended that we would have neighborhood justices as justice centers proliferating across victoria and that did not happen to the extent that we have one, and uh, it remains the, the sole and very impressive example. Bridget, Georgie, Becky, Matthew, anyone on this, what happens when you do have these exemplars of really impressive practice, but they, will, for whatever reason, land like shags on a rock, and we just don't see the take-up beyond that example. And, uh, you know, we should be grateful, I suppose, that the NJC still exists, but the fact that it's not multiplied in every jurisdiction across the state is, is, a, is a real disappointment. So there's something that happens there too, where we fall into a bit of a chasm um, and you can't help but think we're going back to our sort of funding and our vested interest problems. Is there anything else going on uh, Becky or Matthew, that you've seen in your time around these sorts of projects that that seem to be really effective but don't scale. I I would say part of the problem is there's not a community of practice big enough to to survive the secession problem. So some incredible leader who's very charismatic and persuasive convinces that neighborhood to do that, and then <laughs> moves on to the next cool thing, or you know. But I think it's it's a, it's a, the need to sort of get people to understand people-centered justice and its impacts and to be in conversation with each other about it is a way of responding to that secession problem, which I think is part of why these things don't spread. Mm, good point. It's uh, often very personality driven. Matthew, did you want to add? Well, I just think also going back to what we were discussing earlier, the removing some of the political and regulatory constraints on innovation, I think is really critical to scale. <clears throat> the impulse in the US in terms of how it understands uh, regulatory innovation has been things like 
creating many lawyers, right? So uh, licensed paraprofessionals, right? And we know that creating that that putting those same barriers to education and licensing and credentialing and all of those things are not um, are not things that are likely to to produce scale. And so what you see in Alaska, for example, is actually let's take all of those constraints away, right? Let's create uh, modular trainings that are really accessible, right? And eight hours on one thing rather than trying to train people to be generalist. And it's, I think it's intuitive that things like that would scale, right? That when we, we decouple ourselves from lawyer centricity or the centricity of formal justice institutions and allow ourselves to actually experiment uh, with without all of the constraints that we know are limitations on scale, then I think we have lots of opportunities. And so a neighborhood justice center, I think often is still, at least in the US context, highly uh, regulated in terms of what it can do and the kinds of people that can do those things and the ways in which their language and cultural and other expertise are allowed to be uh, at the forefront of how they're engaging with communities. Um, so I think in some ways the kind of systemic shift that needs to happen is to create regulatory environments in which this kind of experimentation can happen. And so we're not starting with at a point where um, if you're designing against regulation or designing against other kinds of constraints and instead you're designing for the kinds of impacts you wanna see in the world. So that's a higher order challenge to say, okay, we need to break down the regulation. We need to open up the, the uh, availability of these sorts of skills and this kind of access. Um, just for people who are maybe not familiar with the Alaskan example, uh, as I understand it, and Matthew and Becky, you, you've probably got, well, I know you've got much closer knowledge of this than I do, but as, as I understand it, it's training up people who are already involved with health workers uh, or health systems in fairly remote parts of the world. I mean, Alaska is, is extremely geographically uh, enormous and uh, very difficult to access. So you train up, as you said, Matthew, in very uh, useful modular ways, people who are already involved in some kind of community and service provision in their, in their locality and give them the tools and the, at this point, the um, capacity in a regulatory context to deliver services. And it's mainly around family law issues. Is that right? My... It's actually quite diverse. So it's okay. family, consumer debt, um, ICWA, which is the uh, Indian Child Welfare Act here, domestic That's violence. Yeah. 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 So these are people who have no legal training, but they clearly have, you know, very strong uh, local community links. They understand services and they are trained in order to represent people in those fora, which is a really remarkable move. And one that uh, I know in the US context was, was uh, revolutionary in terms of giving um, people, non-lawyers, that, that opportunity. So that was a, a really significant breakthrough. Um, I also recall there's another case of, um, was it Oregon? Washington State? Mm -hmm. One of those. Yeah. Northwest. Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Washington State, I think, who tried it and then pulled back. So it's it's kind of two steps forward, one, one back at the moment in that regard, but at least there is progress. Yeah, it's a good example. So the Washington example, the AAA LT program was, um, it's sort of the archetype for how not to design non-lawyer services in the sense that it's uh, it required a tremendous investment of time and money in order to actually be um, right. licensed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the outreach and, and other aspects um, were also, um, you know, sort of constraints on that program. In Alaska, there are now 400 community justice workers who are training uh, or have been trained, uh, and they boast a 100% success rate. So all of our assumptions about how non-lawyers are able to engage with this work have been sort of disrupted. We have a beautiful case study here uh, comparing those two examples. Uh, Bridget and Georgie, we have a question from Karen who wonders why we are constraining ourselves to Victoria when it comes to measure for measure. And secondly, uh, as somebody who works in pro bono in a national firm, she's very interested to, in this study and how the private sector may also uh, uh, be able to, to use and to apply this kind of uh, thinking. And I think that's that's brilliant to hear that there is interest in those quarters as well. 
Georgie, why are we constraining ourselves to Victoria? Look, we are the Victoria Law Foundation and this is very exploratory research. That's not to say that, you know, this report is the beginning and end of our foray into people-centred justice and this eternal question of what works. So uh, I don't know, I would like to see this project as sort of the beginning of a dialogue and hopefully, you know, we can co maybe collaborate with other um, law and justice institutions in the future and, and um, scale up our own project, as it were. It's a bit like the uh, the effort around um, legal needs surveys nationally. We would love to go there. Uh, it's a question of partners and, and money. Bridget, did you have anything further to add there, especially around that, I suppose, the relationship between private and, and uh, public legal provision, service provision, and how that might work and what, what measure for measure might offer? Um, I think it could offer some really useful things and we'd be keen to get examples of those sort of uh, collaborations from Victoria. So we're hoping to hear about whether there are those pro bono relationships in Victoria. We'd love those to be uh, contributing to our study because then we could really be drawing out those lessons because I, I think it's the idea of our project is wide, looking widely at what is done, whether it's public, whether it's private, all those partnerships and collaborations and really trying to tease out those examples that are, people think are working. So uh, putting the call out there for mm. if those, there are those examples of collaborations um, between public and pro boners in Victoria, we'd love to hear from those. Um, and yeah, just talking about the Victorian context, we it's already quite a large scope uh, in terms, so that's why we've limited it uh, to the state as well as it's a follow-on from our data mapping and our pulse report. So we've got the legal need in Victoria. So really it, that's where we're initially coming on. What is the response to this hugely unmet legal need that we found in Victoria from Polk? Yes, it sits on um, a useful foundation of, of work, which is is Victorian, hence the um, the, the next phase, but we invite uh, other um, interstate and national uh, organisations to consider how that might be possible on a, a, a broader scale. Really interesting question from Justine, I think, about uh, evaluation in general terms. And she's referring here to the, the NJC, but it's that risk that some people uh, fear around what happens when you uh, very rigorously evaluate uh, an operation, what might be revealed uh, as ineffective or problematic in that. And I suppose there, that generates some resistance and, you know, it's, I think, evident to, to many of us that this is to be, uh, to be observed. Becky and Matthew, have you sort of overcome this kind of resistance? If people are anxious about really unearthing what works uh, because they're, they're very fearful of the consequences, they may get defunded, they might get, you know, uh, uh, suffer negative consequences as a result of some really honest uh, investigation. But, you know, um, it's a tough one. Becky? I mean, when you talk to to program designers and providers, they all want to do their job well, right? And they all want this information, but they also, I mean, funders are not, not all funders are open to the fact that when you try new things, sometimes they won't work, right? So there's some some education for, for both government and, and philanthropic funders to get. And I think it's also goes back to, to, this need to have a community of people who know each other and are in conversation and can think about, okay, you found this uncomfortable thing about what I'm doing. How are we going to message that? And how, you know, how much of that's going to stay internal to the program or the project so that it can fix itself? And how much of that, how are you going to communicate the learning out in a way that doesn't uh, put the program at such risk? I think it, it can be done, but yeah, there, there, are, there are significant challenges there. Mm -hmm. And especially in a political dynamic where failure is 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 death, um, and if you've put significant funds behind something, and and for, even if the evaluation shows you know eighty five percent positive and fifteen negative, you can be very confident of where the media will land or the political opponents will put their uh, 
put their efforts, it's to that 15%, and that can often really cripple organisations that are otherwise doing really, really important and impressive work. Bridget, have you got sort of experience or thoughts about that kind of resistance you get? And are you concerned that that might be the case with Measure for Measure? Um, yeah, it's challenging, that resistance, that um, uh, just a lack of being open to failure and having being able to have those robust discussions. Um, I think we do think in Measure for Measure um, that, you know, people will be showing us the shiny stories. I think it's trying to drill down, particularly the second phase will be about uh, some interviews with um, a number of the interviews, uh, initiatives. And I think then we're trying to drill down particularly into that evidence and being really open about, you know, the journey and, and the journey of these initiatives and knowing that it's not necessarily you design something, you put it out there, you evaluate it and it's perfect and whole and then you just keep doing that. Mm. It's about really trying to unpack that journey of how programs and projects have evolved, have they learnt th things, have they tried things and how that actually is incredibly valuable about having the space and having the leadership within an organisation to allow that, to allow that to happen, the, allow the evolution and to allow that um, continuous reflection process to happen and trying to draw out those stories of how things have evolved and how they might have worked 100% in the first way and trying to capture those stories because that is incredibly rich learning. I think something I always used to look to was Engineers Without Borders. I think Canada used to release an annual failure report. Um, and a lot of it was just stories from the field, but it was just actually labelling it, publicly la labelling it as an annual failure report was a great positioning. And, and in, you know, I'm not sure how it worked actually on the ground, <laughs> if it worked, but it seemed like a great way of just going out there going, we don't get these things right all the time. And even if they're just personal stories, by calling it that and owning it, I think that's such an, a great example and I'd love to see more of it there, but it's, yeah, the political environment and the competitive funding. I think that really means people are always putting on the the front, yeah. the shiny thing and the lessons learned become such bin from a lot of this project because they've got to go into another funding cycle and they're competing against their other ones. But anyhow, we are, we are aware of that for a measure for measure. And as I said, we're really keen to unpack those stories of continuous reflection and evolution of projects and draw that out as a positive, as a success, um, and how that ends up just continuing to create more tailored and appropriate solutions. Well, there is no question in, in my experience that when people come to you with really, you know, issues, uh, tricky issues or, or things that might be seeming to derail a project, that's when they get really, really good. <laughs> that's when you can actually uh, make something that's going to be effective and sustainable and hopefully scalable. So with all of that, um, I think we might draw it to a conclusion and thank very, very much indeed our panellists today, Bridget McAloon, Professor Rebecca Sandifer, Matthew Burnett, and Georgie Rickner, and to you for joining us from all points of the compass today. This has been a Victoria Law Foundation Research Network event. We hold them every three months. And our aim is to bring you insights, uh, both international and domestic, uh, in developments in access to justice and legal needs work. And if you've got any ideas for future sessions, we would love to hear from you. Please get in touch because we're very open to whatever's going on around the world. Or if you have a project to submit for Measure for Measure, we would be delighted to hear from you. Please target Bridget and Georgie and they'll be back in touch with you as soon as possible, I'm sure, to discuss. Don't forget the video for this session is uh, shortly to be available, so please pass it on to whomever you might think would be interested or you can watch it again, you know, just because it's so much fun. And great thanks as always to Tanil and to Jackie for making this session happen. We look forward very much to seeing you again at our next research network event and have a fine day. Cheers. <laughs>